morning everyone. Habari yenu? We say mzuri sana here. Habari yenu? Mzuri sana. Uh, as Ken put it, my name is Njoki Gashanja. I am from Kenya. I am from the social justice uh, movement. Um, it is such a great feeling to be in the presence of fellow Africans. This room is full of the Pan-African spirit, and I can feel it. It is always such a pleasure to just among fellow Africans to share their experiences and to ask ourselves how far we have come and are we free yet? Are we, uh, do we have that democracy that we so much talk about? Um, as Ken was saying that uh, they really had the struggle of getting a legitimizing siasa place. I, I just, I kept nodding as I, as I sat there because that, that is still our struggle as a social justice movement. Apparently in Kenya right now, anyone who touches the name social justice or human rights cannot register as a community-based organization. That is where we are. So when you go to these offices, they will tell you, uh -uh, you have social justice in your name. Uh -uh, we can't do that here. You have to go to another um, office that is above us. Uh -uh, you have human rights in your name. Uh -uh, we can't register here you in the community. You have to go to another office that is above us. An office that will be able to monitor you and your ways. So as I start, um, the, the journey of democracy in Kenya. I want to start in the 1990s because every single time the word democracy is mentioned in Kenya, the very first um, image that comes to us is what we now call the second liberation, the 1990s, the Saba Saba. Every time you mention democracy in Kenya, the faces that come to you are the likes of Wangari Mathai, of Kenneth Matiba, of Charles Rubia, of James Orengo, of Raila Odinga. Those are the faces that come to you. Anytime you talk about democracy, the images that come to you is Anjoya, Rever Reverend Timothy Anjoya on a pavement being clobbered by policemen. The images that come to your head are those of Wangare Madhai with her braids um, plucked off from her head and she's bleeding all over. The images that come to you are those of a Kenneth Matiba who was once very articulate, but after he got arrested in that um, in that struggle for democracy, he became almost um, he, he he became almost a vegetable. So those are the images that come to you every single time we talk about democracy in Kenya, because it has been that struggle. But as I stand here today, and as we talk about democracy, and as we are told that we have achieved so much from 1990s, I beg to differ. Because in 1990, when we had our first Saba Saba, when we had that spring to push, the push was to have people have a voice. The push was to have multi-partisan. Because at that particular time, there was only one party ruling. And it was calling the shots. And people were so tired and they said, now we want to be able to have the people decide who the leadership is, the governance. But when the Section 2A was repealed and multipartism was restored, I still feel that what we got was a smokescreen. 
it, we were played. It, it was all public relations because they said they got to a place and realized we cannot overpower these people. So what we can do, we can play into their games. We can give them what they want, but we can make them play to our rules. I will take you back to 1980, when we had a very, very vibrant youth. It is the only time in our Kenyan history when we go back that we register a vibrant youth, especially in the university. A youth that was ready to lay their lives for what they believed in. Because at that particular time, they realized and agreed with Jaramogi Odinga when he said, we were not yet Uhuru. We just put that flag up that mountain when we got our independence, but we never really got independence. Things were bad after um, Jomo Kenyatta took over. He just continued. It became neo-colonialism. It was like we were shifting from the white and now having black masters, which is even worse because we'd rather have uh, white and say it's because they don't look like us. But to have your own person now colonializing you, things got bad. And that is when in the 1980s, we got our students in the university rise up and say, enough is enough. This was during President Moy's regime. And so he said, you, th you think you're smarter than me? I'm going to show you. And he went all out to squash the youth. Anyone who did not agree with his dictatorial terms was not having, he was not having any of it. Many youths in the university were arrested. They're what we call now the political prisoners. They're old and frail right now. But by then, they were our heroes. And they went to jail for us. The likes of Olo Onyango, may his soul rest in peace. The likes of William Utunga. The likes of um, Kamonji. They all went to jail for us. Mainak uh, Wakenyati, he's still telling those stories of the experiences they had in prison. You read his book and you cannot sleep because of the experiences he gives. <coughs> Thing, things that they went through just to have that democratic space that we still don't enjoy to date. So when Moi went all out to squash the university students, we have never recovered. From 1980s to now, we have not had a vibrant youth. We have not had a youth that says we are ready to go the whole way. We have a youth that is intimidated, that is frustrated, that for so many years has been taught to say, Bora Uhai. That means, it's okay, I'm alive. So here in Kenya, we say Bora Uhai. That is where we are, we are that desperate. We have not, for a very long time, in that time, when Moy went out and said, I'm going to squash these people, he went an extra mile and said, now I'm going to indoctrinate Nyayoism. So he started planting ideas that you have to depend on the system, that you cannot think for yourself, that you have to depend on us for survival. And for a very long time, that has been the narrative that people have believed in. Our history as Kenyans, as we celebrate it today, 
is very distorted. We celebrate the wrong heroes. We, they got to a place and demonized our real heroes. A very, very uh, quick, important fact. For a very longest time, Mau Mau is very famous as uh, our freedom fighters. But it was just the other day that the ban was lifted. For a very long time, it, it existed as uh, an illegitimate, illegitimate group. It was unlawful. So the people who we keep saying fought for our independence or for a very long time lived up as criminals. They were outlaws. So our history as Kenyans for a very long time, as we have known it, has been distorted. And that is why the social justice movement had it. A youth that still remained conscious admits all the frustration. People who go through um, the waves of criminalization of poverty, because that is our biggest struggle right now as Kenyans, and especially the youth who come from the informal settlement. In Kenya, if you're poor, then it's a crime. If you're poor, then you must be a thief. If you're poor and you're a woman, then there's something that you're doing that is not right. The levels of criminalization of poverty that we go through as a youth of Kenya every single day is the one point that has got the social justice movement saying enough is enough. Saying that first, for us to pick up from the 1980s where we were squashed, we first need to tell our history right. We need to celebrate our heroes, our real heroes. We need to tell our stories as they are, push our narratives as they are, not having anyone else who's not going through what we're going through push our narrative. Because we youth, especially from the ghetto, know exactly what it means to just survive a day here. So no one is going to tell our stories. We're going to tell our stories ourselves. We're going to push for dignity. We're going to push for equal distribution of resources because our constitution guarantees us that. Currently in Kenya, there's a push to have a referendum. We just promulgated our constitution um, 10 years ago. It's not even worked. It's not been implemented. It just remains a document. Nine years from 2010, it just remains a document. But now, because they have their own interest, the governance, the leadership, they want to change it a bit more. Not for the ordinary Kenyan. Nobody has gone to the ground to ask, so, since we had this new document, what has it done for you? Do you still want to change it? Nobody. Nobody. But now, the push is on to have a referendum. And sure enough, we're going to have a referendum. Why? Because the system decides. And it is such things that get us to these spaces. It is such blatant, you know, um, discrepancies that get us to these places where we say, no, we are the people. The Constitution gives us the power, and we're going to take it, the power. 
We are told power is never given. So how are we going to take the power? We're saying the democracy as it is right now is abnormal, and the ways uh, we're trying to do it is different. Why? Because we've learned from the 1970s, from the 1960s, from the 1980s. What they did then, we're learning, and we're making change. When they uh, had their coup in 1982, it was just a desperate youth that had come together, and they said, we do not want this system. But they were not organized. So those are the lessons that we're picking as the movement currently in Kenya. Because if we, if we do not learn from our past, then we're not going anywhere. If you were going to a shop today and when you left your house, you had money, and when you got to the shop, you didn't have money, it would simply mean that you dropped it somewhere. So if you really want to buy whatever it is you wanted to buy, you will have to go back on your tracks and find where you dropped your money, where you dropped your value. So it is exactly the same thing the youth of Kenya are doing right now. We're backstepping. We're learning from the past. We're going back to see where did we lose it? And how do we get it back? What lessons have we learned so far? Is the democracy that we're talking about existing? Do we really have it? As African countries, and like, like it was said before, our struggles are connected. I am very sure whatever we're going through in Kenya is the very same thing going on in all your countries. So how then do we connect our struggle? How then do we in one voice say enough? How then do we bring back Africa to what it was? How is it that we will get back to that space where I can go to South Africa and work and not have to worry that my fellow African will look at me as an enemy? How do we get, how do we get there? What conversations are we having to get us there? One of the biggest encouragements that I get, especially from the social justice movement, is the vision that the youth have, is the extent they're willing to go to get back their country. And like we said, Times have changed, so revolutions don't have to be by guns. Most of the system disable us by instilling fear in people, by telling people that a revolution necessarily means bloodshed. It doesn't have to be. We can have what we call a revolution by the ballot, but how do we get that? by giving power back to the people, by embracing what our constitutions give us. They're not just documents, they're spirits that guide and lead us. And that is where we all need to get, for everyone to understand that dignity is not a favor to get from the system. That poverty is actually a creation of the system. To get the narratives right as Africans, because as Africans, we are losing it on the narratives. We are being fed a lot of lies, and we are gulping water to take the lies down. 
It's time we say enough is enough. Let's tell our stories. Be upset. Be really upset that you do not have a dignified life. Because social justice means exactly that. That if you get sick today, there's health care. And you do not have to pay an arm and a leg for it. That your children will have quality education. And not an education that is supposed to just manufacture workers and robots. That our housing is decent. I hope when tomorrow you, you go to the centers, the various centers, you get to experience that life, that everyday life of what it means for that community person down there. When they wake up and they have to jump over sewers, live sewers, right outside there. You know, and children are playing there. And we've, been, we've become so okay with that kind of life. We've become so comfortable. And we say, ah, we are just third world countries. Ah, it's just Africa. I mean, when I make it, I will just take an aeroplane and I will go. So who's going to make Africa great again if we all go? Who's going to make that? So as I stand here, I'm very confident that we, the youth of Kenya, are in one voice saying, where the likes of Wangari Mathai left, we are picking up the bark, we are learning our lessons, and we are going. And we are taking back our country. And we will have a plan. And that plan will be to have a social justice nation where every day we wake up and I say, I am Kenyan, I smile. I don't want to wake up and remember, gosh, I'm Kenyan again. <laughs> I wish today I woke up and I was something else. No. Because make no mistake, he who created you had a choice. I mean, he would have chosen. Uh, maybe I could make this one Brit. Maybe I could make this one, you know. But he chose for you to be Ugandan. He chose for you to be Nigerian. He chose for you to be Kenyan. So you have a reason. You have a purpose. So you can't just up, take an aeroplane and leave. Where are you going? Stay here. We are making Africa great again, all of us. No one is leaving. No one is leaving. And as I think, and as I finish, is it on? And just simply um, capturing the creativity and the stance that the youth are embracing to take back power. It truly means through art, revolution will not be by the gun because we are not losing any more people. But we will use 
all these other means that we have, we will be creative and we will take back. We will take back power and give it back to the people. Because that is where it's supposed to be, not where it is right now. So we might not be yet where we're going to be with all this democracy. But we're on the right track. And we're not giving up. Because the president was set. So it is for us to follow the steps. I cannot wait to hear your experiences so that we finally make that connection. I want to thank the ESO place for finally bringing us into that one room, into that one forum where we can exchange notes and say, okay, maybe this happened in our country. You could, you could try it here because our settings look the same. And I'm very positive that when we live here, we will be in one voice say, we have the power. Thank you very much.